Chapter Twenty Nine of Prodigal Daughters by Joseph Hawking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kate Fallis. Chapter Twenty Nine Peggy's Betrayal. Bewildered as she was, Peggy had to read this letter more than once before the full meaning of it burst upon her. Presently, however, she understood barnes was tired of her and had thrown her off like an old glove his family conniving at the action he had taken she saw now why they were so anxious for her to go see her sister and understood why they told her not to come back until nine o'clock they had made this an opportunity whereby they could be rid of her not caring what became of her oh the horror the degradation of it for some time she did not know what she was doing or where she was going she only knew that she was adrift in london and that she the daughter of general trelawney was alone and unprotected in the london streets a castaway what could she do where could she go a sense of utter desolation and misery possessed her and she was ashamed beyond words at that moment she scarcely cared what happened to her she was not yet nineteen years of age and what had the future for her up to now she had in spite of everything refused to be anything but loyal to barnes she had excused his words of cruelty she had fought against the loathing which sometimes filled her when she realized that she was wedded to him for life in her way and in spite of all her faults she had tried to think kindly of him and to be loving to him for his sake she had refused to share eleanor's offered hospitality ay and more than that for his sake she had refused to go to her own home for his sake too she had borne with his sister's sneers and jibes and his mother's constant insults and now it had come to this what could she do again the question haunted her she remembered what barnes had said only two nights before when she had suggested spending the afternoon with her sister you can throw yourself in the river he had snarled i don't care what you do well why not life had nothing to offer her she would not go to eleanor and tell her what had taken place she simply could not she could see the look that would come into her sister's eyes the bitter smile that would curl on her lips for a long time she walked unheeding whither she went then presently she realized that she had passed from the streets and had entered an open space the wind had risen and dark clouds were being swept across the sky above her head she saw patches of blue and here and there a star shining why this was hampstead heath she was near home not more than five minutes walk from her father's house almost instinctively she thought of the morning when her father and mother had come to her and she remembered the former's words good morning my dear you'll remember that your father's and mother's house is always open to you she had felt at the time that his unconscious emphasis on the last word was an insult to the man to whom she had sworn to be loyal but now it came to her like healing balm they still loved her in spite of everything she was her dad's little peggy still great sobs rose to her throat sobs which almost choked her what shall i do what shall i do she wailed oh god help me oh if they only would if they only would but i dare not i'm ashamed her old home seemed like heaven to her now and the restrictions which at one time seemed so irksome were something to rejoice in oh to have a home and tenderness and love to be with her own people 
to breathe the atmosphere of affection and refinement oh god help her if she only could what would john say what would treb's fiance say did her father really mean it when he told her she might come home he was a proud man and would shudder at anything like disgrace coming to his name and she had disgraced it by becoming the wife of such a creature as barnes and yet then there came to her memory like some long-forgotten dream the words she had read in childhood and forgotten in her girlhood a saying from the most beautiful story ever told i will arise and go to my father and i will say unto him father i have sinned but could she all the time she had been walking walking she knew not whither then suddenly she saw a light yes it was home that was her father's house there was a light coming from one of the windows she crept wearily along no longer her feet seemed to be winged and she rushed pantingly to the door of her old home she knocked timidly like one afraid then as there was no answer more loudly she heard footsteps in the hall firm decided footsteps and the door opened yes what is it it was her father's voice it's me dad peggy will you let me come in peggy yes dad i've i've come home i have no home but this will you have me in a second the general understood he required no mental process to comprehend everything his heart leapt to the truth my little peggy he cried come in my darling come in you must be cold come in there let me see your face kiss your old dad my little girl i am glad you have come he drew her to the warm well-lighted room as he spoke and held her close to his heart while the girl sobbed convulsively i didn't know i was so near then i saw the light i i didn't know what i was doing but but i couldn't help it i have come home dad i'm so miserable and ashamed her words came incoherently between great heart-breaking sobs she scarcely knew what she was saying but the long pent-up feelings which had been buried in her heart for months were trying to find expression meanwhile her father held her to his heart his brain even yet had failed to grasp the situation but his love made him understand everything there there peggy it's all right it's your old home my dear no matter what's happened everything is right and his voice was hoarse because his heart was in a wild tumult i'm i'm so ashamed stammered peggy but but i couldn't help coming something drew me here in spite of myself when i found out what i was what it all meant i think i went mad i didn't know where i was going i thought i would go to the river and throw myself into the water there seemed nothing else for me then i saw i was on the heath and and i didn't know where i was going although i kept on walking then i saw the light will will you have me dad i know i've been a bad girl but i couldn't help coming home something made me have you of course i'll have you there my darling don't fear anything your old dad is here he will keep you safe there sit before the fire and let me pull off your wet cold boots then i'll go to your mother and tell her you have come home he drew her to an armchair as he spoke and took off her hat and jacket are you better now my little peg he went on scarcely realizing what he was saying or doing you're cold and hungry aren't you there there now don't cry it's all right i'll go and fetch mother 
no no not yet sobbed the girl what shall i do for you then i'm so glad to see you peg is there anything you want i'll get mother here in a minute she'll know better than i what to do no no not yet persisted peggy please dad she sobbed let me sit on your knee like i used to i haven't sat on your knee since before the war and and yes my darling said the general whose eyes were brimming with tears that's it there now sit on my knee and put your arms round my neck as you used to years ago and tell me everything she laid her head on his shoulder like a tired broken-hearted child and then she sobbed out her story such a pitiful story so common yet so tragic she told it between heartbroken sobs and exclamations of shame and sorrow and is that all asked the general at length that's all except that i want to be with you and and i want oh i want mother of course you do it's all right your old dad is gladder than words can tell to have you back yes i understand what you feel it's all a miserable business but never mind you have come home now there there kiss me again my dear but but do you really forgive me do you really mean to say that you'll have me here just as if i hadn't been so wicked for oh i have been so miserable so ashamed and and i do want to be good and i do want mother of course you do the general half laughed and half sobbed out the words don't be afraid peggy we'll make everything right the old miserable past is over and in some way we'll begin anew there there i'll go and fetch mother he rushed away as he spoke while the child looked around the room she had known all her life there were the old books the old pictures the old furniture everything she saw seemed to bid her welcome everything seemed to tell her of an undying love this was home the home which in her madness and in her wickedness she had left but which was now the haven of refuge for which she so longed she heard murmuring voices and hasty footsteps and then she knew she was in her mother's arms she heard her mother's voice felt the warm kisses on her cheek she wanted to explain wanted to she knew not what oh mother he's left me and and it's wrong i know but i'm glad he has i could not go to him again even if he wanted me it's all been so awful so horrible of course it has cried mrs trelawney she seemed to know what to do better than her husband there was that touch of intimacy knowledge and innate wisdom which helps to make the crooked places straight and the rough places plain of course you mustn't cry what is there to cry about you've come home my darling and lester can't you see that the poor child is tired and faint the servants have gone to bed but that doesn't matter oh yes it's no use telling me peggy i know you're hungry i'll go and get something for you there was healing in every word in every tone in every movement the child's bitter wounded bleeding heart felt it and understood there were no reproachful questions no upbraidings no saying i told you so the time for these things might come later but now it was heartfelt gladness a welcome home which her poor little soul longed for no no i'm not going to let you talk to me about all those miserable things 
cried the mother as peggy again tried to return to her sordid tale of the past few months there's no need for that now and you must not trouble a bit about the future we shall be able to talk about that some other time all that matters now is that you are here my darling i was afraid that you would be away sobbed peggy it seemed strange that you should be up so late i could not go to bed said the general i don't know why but i felt as though i must sit up the door opened again and john entered hello peg old girl said the boy rather awkwardly good business i thought i heard your voice so i put on these clothes over my pyjamas and came down yes peg's come home cried the general come to stay isn't it splendid he left me this said peggy piteously handing john the letter which barnes had written i've been staying with his mother and and jack don't look like that for john had read the letter by this time and knew the whole truth as if by intuition the mean dirty swine but it's all right peg he'll never trouble you any more said the boy speaking awkwardly but with a look shining from his eyes which made peggy understand in spite of everything of course it's going to be all right said mrs trelawney of course it's going to be all right said mrs trelawney are you quite warm now darling will you have something more to eat no no mother don't mind my crying but it's all so beautiful i never knew before how beautiful it was dad you're sure it's you aren't you you're sure i'm home really will you let me get on your knee again and dad you're sure you forgive me aren't you i have been wicked but but i do want to be a good girl the general took her on his knee again there there my little peggy snuggle up close to me just as you did in the old days when i used to tell you stories before i put you to bed is that all right it's just beautiful dad she sobbed just beautiful unmindful of the time they sat together talking little by little peggy became calmer and in spite of their protests she insisted on telling her story again such a mean miserable story she seemed to want to unburden her heart to throw from her life the experiences of the last few months it might be as though she were a little child again a little kitty who had been naughty but now entered the happiness which comes through forgiveness but it was more than that and although they said nothing of it each knew it especially did the general feel that although his little peggy had come home contrite and repentant that he with all his love could never wipe out the past he saw by her shudders and by her expression of loathing when barnes's name was mentioned the misery and the truth he could not undo the fact that in many senses his child's life was ruined and that in the days to come she would feel the pollution of her association with the man with whom she had been madly infatuated but he would not upbraid her he would try as far as in him lay to destroy the effect of those miserable months he knew she had destroyed much of her girlhood she had made her future black with a kind of shame which she could not express and she would be forever haunted by the thought that her life had been contaminated with evil she had come back but it could never be as though she had never gone away there were still the months which the locusts had eaten but he kept all that from peggy in spite of everything his heart went out to her with a great overwhelming love and the thought of her contrition and her penitence went far to atone for the pain she had caused him we must get trev home he cried i'm sure it can be managed and we must get mary penryn up here too 
you'll like her peg yes she's a ripping girl was john's emphasis you must get her up here to-morrow dad i'll bring her up to lunch if you like i'll run down with the car for her to-morrow morning and now we won't talk any longer said mrs trelawney i can see you're tired i feel as though i shall never be tired again sobbed peggy ah but you are i insist on you going to bed now a few minutes later peggy was in her own bedroom the bedroom she had known from childhood oh how beautiful how restful everything was she recognized every article in the room nothing seemed to have been changed since she left it it had been furnished according to her own desires and tastes the colorings were perfect everything accorded with everything else and it was all so sweet and restful an air of refinement prevailed too everything was so different from the vulgar squalor of primrose terrace is everything all right peggy asked her mother kneel with me as i say my prayers she sobbed just as you used to do in the old days mother i've been a wicked girl but i will be good oh i will be good side by side they knelt while the mother scarcely less moved than her child put her arm around her please god forgive me and help me to be a good girl it was the old prayer of her childhood which came back to her and for the moment she felt like a child again and after all she was but little more but her childhood had gone and she knew it and although she could not put it into words she felt the tragedy of it there now go to sleep said her mother as peggy nestled among the clean white sheets we shall be here in the morning may i come in peggy yes dad please come the general knelt beside the bed and kissed her god bless you my little girl he said and his voice broke good night we'll meet in the morning end of chapter twenty nine Chapter Thirty of Prodigal Daughters by Joseph Hawking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kate Fallis. Chapter Thirty, at Spurling and Kings. Eleanor Trelawney had said but little to her sister about her own experiences. She had told her nothing of the episode which had so frightened her neither had she mentioned rod ravenscroft in any way on the morning following ravenscroft's visit she had received a letter from ellen chellew telling her that she did not intend to return to the flat again and asking her to forward her things to a given address as eleanor read the letter she felt the tragedy of it and instead of doing what she had been asked she wrote a long letter to ellen beseeching her to come back her eyes were being opened but her letter was sent in vain two days later she received another epistle from ellen to the effect that she had counted the cost of her action and that she did not intend to be tied down to puritanical notions as for eleanor herself her mind was in a condition difficult to describe her experiences on the night when ravenscroft had rescued her from a position which she shrank from thinking about had somehow revolutionized her whole being she could not understand the infatuation which women of the tamsin cory class had had over her the sudden revelation of her feelings in regard to rod ravenscroft had changed everything never had eleanor realized the helplessness of her future as she realized it now for years she had rather gloried in the idea that men had no attraction for her 
she had been pleased when she had been referred to as sexless the whole idea of giving her life to any man was utterly out of accord with her philosophy of life for that reason she had been largely oblivious to ravenscroft's real feelings towards her and if she had known she would not have cared of course she was very young and had been well-nigh carried off her feet by tamsin cory and was under the spell of women who proclaimed the new era of moral and intellectual liberty which had hitherto been denied to her sex then followed the events which are outlined in this narrative with all a foolish girl's confidence in her own powers she had seen no danger in her associations with wakeham other women had their men friends why not she it was true she did not like wakeham he struck her as a coarse somewhat unpleasant specimen of the man about town but she reflected that he might be helpful to her especially in view of peggy's difficulties but she was not afraid her own feelings were entirely platonic and she laughed at the idea that she eleanor trelawney who had always been spoken of as cold as an icicle would be unable to take care of herself up to that time she was as determined as ever not to submit to the restrictions of home life neither did she repent of the step she had taken of course she missed many of the refinements and comforts of her father's house at hampstead but in their place she had her liberty and she was able to live her own life then came that awful moment when rod ravenscroft had rescued her from the ghastly position in which she had found herself she realized the horror she had of such men as wakeham realized too how they regarded women of course one thing had been made plain to her she was no longer able to go to speak and burnham's she imagined that in any case wakeham would make it impossible but even if he desired her to retain her old position she could not do so she therefore wrote to the firm resigning her position but what to do she did not know she had but very little money and how to live was a question which stared her in the face on the monday she diligently searched the advertisements in the newspaper for something that might suit her many of these advertisements she answered sometimes in writing sometimes in person but nothing came of them positions no longer went begging and there seemed to be half a dozen applicants for every one that was open at the end of a week she was well nigh in despair that she must leave st hildebrand's mansions was evident shabby and uncomfortable as her rooms were she could not pay for them indeed as she looked at the rapidly diminishing contents of her purse a great terror possessed her then suddenly great good fortune came to her she received a letter from a well-known firm in the city signed by one of the partners which seemed to her like a message from heaven she could not understand it what could such a firm as spurling and king know of her she was not aware that these people were cognizant of her existence yet the letter before her was plain enough dear madam it ran we are given to understand that you have left messrs speak and burnham where you acted as secretary to mr wakeham of that firm as i am in need of a secretary and as i judge from what i have heard of your capabilities you would be able to do the work i require i shall be glad if you are open to consider the situation which i offer if you will call at the above address to-morrow morning at half-past ten yours faithfully alfred spurling the news seemed too good to be true surely it must be a hoax but no it could not be it was written on the firm's note-paper and bore every sign of genuineness spurling and king was an old established firm of merchants 
it was on the highest pedestal of respectability and was known for its soundness and its old-fashioned ways she had heard it spoken of as a firm which had fought long against modern innovations and had for years refused to adopt either the telephone or the typewriter of course she would go there was an old-world courtesy manifest in the letter which cheered her in spite of herself when she arrived at the offices of spurling and king she was impressed by the atmosphere of the place everything was quiet and orderly the furniture of the offices was somewhat old but it suggested security and respectability there was none of the rush and hurry which she had seen at speak and burnham's most of the clerks were middle-aged men some indeed were quite old and looked as though they had been there all their lives will you come this way said the man who looked at the paper on which her name and business were written mr spurling is expecting you a minute later she was ushered into a spacious office which seemed so quiet and restful that it might have been far away from the great rushing life of the metropolis the furniture of the room was rich and costly thickly piled carpets covered the floor great heavy mahogany desks and cases were placed around the room everything spoke of prosperity and order seated at a desk not far from a glowing fire sat a portly white-haired old gentleman who looked at her steadily for a few seconds through his gold-rimmed spectacles he might have been from sixty-five to seventy years of age and had a benign placid appearance which reminded eleanor of the prosperous old-time merchant of a hundred years ago there was no suggestion of the get-rich-quick kind of man in this old gentleman he was not the sort who would touch risky speculations neither would he connive at shady transactions possibly his father and grandfather drove to the city in the old days before trains and telegraphs behind a spanking pair of horses from some comfortable country mansion situated a few miles from london miss eleanor trelawney he queried as he looked at the paper which the man had left with him the girl nervously assented good old-fashioned names both of them remarked the old gentleman with a smile any relation of the trelawney family of cornwall i believe we are distantly connected replied the girl but we don't know them no but it's a good old-fashioned name anyhow but you are not old-fashioned i take it miss trelawney i don't quite understand you sir ventured eleanor i dare say you don't what i meant was that you have broken away from the old traditions concerning a woman's place and work i hear you are an excellent stenographer and typist that you understand bookkeeping and have quite an intimate knowledge of affairs generally i hear too that you know a good deal about shipping a little replied eleanor let me see how much and forthwith he put to the girl a number of questions technical as well as general about the great shipping industries of the world while he did so he was no longer the placid benign old gentleman but the keen man of affairs who had his finger on the pulse of the world's commerce yes he said with a smile when that part of his catechism was over for a young lady you know a great deal where and how did you learn it eleanor told him i see he went on but even with the facilities you have had it requires a good deal of intelligence to learn so much in such a short time but what about your stenography and typing i want to know something of that i may tell you that i am very particular about my letters and about the way drafts of contracts are drawn up i make a strong point of punctuation and paragraphing sometimes too i dictate very rapidly 
and i require such intelligence and education on the part of my secretary as will enable her to interpret my meaning as well as the exact words i utter in short i hate the idea of an automaton and desire an intelligent secretary do you mind if i put you to the test a minute later eleanor was seated at a table writing rapidly while the old gentleman walked to and fro dictating a technical document there he said at the end of ten minutes if you'll get that transcribed i shall see whether you can help me in the way i desire eleanor seated herself before the typewriter and commenced her work at first she was so excited and nervous that she made many mistakes but before she reached the end of the page she was in full possession of her faculties again she therefore threw the page away and commenced a new one at the end of half an hour she had the document all ready the old gentleman read it carefully word by word noting each paragraph each colon each semicolon each full stop yes he said at length this will do very well you work carefully and rapidly there are no scratchings out no smudges there is not only education here but intelligence as far as i can see i shall not have to make a single alteration he stood for a few minutes as if thinking deeply do you like this kind of work miss trelawney no replied the girl then why do you do it forgive me i did not speak quite accurately replied eleanor i do like it in a way the drudgery of typewriting is not pleasant but there is real interest in the human side of business it appeals to the imagination it widens one's outlook besides one must do what one can yes yes i see it might have been that questions of a personal nature were hanging upon his lips but he did not ask them perhaps his conception of the courtesy due to a lady prevented him i think you may regard yourself as engaged miss trelawney he said presently thank you i will do my best yes said the old gentleman after a pause you are on the point of asking me something what is it i was wondering if you did not require references said eleanor with a painful blush something she knew not what dragged the words from her references ah yes of course but you are a daughter of general lester trelawney are you not yes he bears a great name a good name with regard to your business abilities i have satisfied myself and of course the daughter of general trelawney should not need to be recommended still perhaps you would not mind my writing to your father i would rather you did not replied eleanor ah why i would rather you did not she repeated i am sorry for that i want to be absolutely frank with you mr spurling said eleanor i have left my father's house dear dear wasn't he kind to you no no i recall that question i had no right to ask it i think you had replied the girl all the same i'd rather not answer it she felt ashamed of herself why she did not know except that there was something in this courtly old-fashioned gentleman's demeanour which made her feel that she had done something unworthy in a way he reminded her of her father although he was altogether different from him there was no suggestion of military precision such as she had associated with her father instead of being tall spare upright the very embodiment of a british soldier mr spurling was portly and somewhat homely in his appearance and yet she saw the stamp of the same kind of man of course you'll be willing for me to refer to speak in burnham queried mr spurling yes she replied 
but i saw little either of mr speke or mr burnham i was secretary to mr wakeham and again she flushed painfully and you left there on your own accord yes may i ask why eleanor's lips became tremulous and she spoke with difficulty because mr wakeham was not a gentleman she replied mr spurling was silent for a few seconds then he said with a smile perhaps both mr speke and mr burnham know more about you than you think however i feel quite confident in engaging you if you care to come to me yes there is another question you want to ask me what is it again eleanor felt afraid this old gentleman pleasant and benign as he appeared to be seemed to possess a kind of intuition a power of reading her unexpressed thoughts you were wondering how i came to hear of you he went on but my dear young lady you need not trouble about that people in my position have all sorts of means of finding out things besides i happen to know the firm you were with before you went to speak in burnham's there's nothing else is there oh yes i forgot there's the question of salary if it is not rude on my part how much did they give you eleanor told him i will continue that replied mr spurling if it's quite agreeable to you thank you replied the girl and by the way miss trelawney i have a young lady in the office who has been with me some time poor girl she's very unfortunate she has just lost her father and is for the moment without a home i wonder if you know of lodgings which are within her means honeywood is her name quite a nice girl if if she would share my rooms cried eleanor eagerly a few minutes later she had explained to mr spurling how she was situated ah i should think that would suit miss honeywood very well but of course you must see her before anything is settled living together is a very serious matter and you and she might not like each other i think you will though then there is another matter i must introduce you to miss statham miss statham is my partner's secretary indeed she is something more than a secretary and has very intimate relationships with the firm it is well that you should know her she is a very capable woman very capable indeed she has been with us something like ten years will you come this way he led the way to an adjoining office as he spoke an office which was almost a replica of the one she had just left the same air of comfort prevailed the same quietness the same order and the same atmosphere of established prosperity seated at a desk similar to that of mr spurling sat a gentleman who might have been five years his junior he was faultlessly attired and although not portly like mr spurling suggested the same quiet contentment near to him sat a woman of about thirty-five years of age with whom he had evidently been conversing on an important matter this is miss trelawney mr king the young lady i told you about she has been with me for the last hour and i think we have satisfied each other that we shall be able to work together i am delighted miss trelawney said mr king rising from his chair and holding out his hand you'll find mr spurling a hard taskmaster but i will say this of him he is very just extremely so in fact this is miss statham and he nodded to the lady who sat near him she has been with us a good many years now and knows our business intimately yes miss trelawney added mr spurling as i told you it will be well for you to know miss statham she will be able to initiate you into the intricacies of our business better than any one and we trust her absolutely absolutely we have reason to eleanor gave a quick glance towards the woman in question she was about thirty-five years of age but she looked younger and in a way handsome 
ten years before she might have been beautiful but now there were lines upon her face an expression of weariness in her demeanour and a look in her eyes difficult to define that she was capable no one could doubt proficiency thoroughness clear-sightedness and a keen appreciation of her duties were manifest in her every look and movement and yet in a way which eleanor could not understand there was something in her presence which repelled her perhaps it was because her mouth was somewhat drawn down at the corners and suggested discontent or perhaps it might have been because of something restless and yearning in her eyes this did not come to eleanor as a distinct thought but as a kind of vague impression which she could neither understand nor put into words and yet she was strangely drawn to her that the woman was a lady it was impossible to doubt it might be too that she moved in good society and certainly if her looks did not utterly belie her she possessed an intelligence of a very high order have you two finished asked mr spurling after a general conversation about the work of the firm we were just finishing as you came in replied mr king miss statham is of opinion that we should take no part in that indian business and i quite agree with her ah you've come to that conclusion too have you replied mr spurling well i'm very glad of it but there are two or three matters i want to speak to you about alone king so you may as well come into my room meanwhile i think it will be well for miss statham and miss trelawney to spend an hour or two together i was just going to suggest the same thing replied mr king miss trelawney will naturally feel somewhat strange and i am sure miss statham will soon familiarize her with what she has to do then there is the question of miss honeywood have you spoken to miss trelawney i have replied mr spurling miss trelawney occupies a little flat quite convenient to her work here and the young lady who has been living with her has lately left her so it will be to their mutual advantage to join forces assuming of course that there is a mutual liking i think there will be too miss honeywood is not brilliant but she is an exceedingly nice girl it's now twelve o'clock said miss statham when the partners had left them together we will have an hour's chat and then go out to lunch together what do you say i shall be delighted replied eleanor who in spite of miss statham's somewhat rigid manner began to be drawn towards her for an hour she explained to eleanor the broad outlines of the business of the firm and the particular duties she would have to perform and as one question led to another eleanor became impressed by the prodigious amount of knowledge which the other had amassed as the conversation proceeded too the older woman became almost enthusiastic the firm did business in almost every part of the world and its transactions were large and important eleanor quickly found that miss statham's knowledge was not only extensive but intimate she was able to explain the locality of shipping centres of which eleanor knew nothing but the name she knew the financial resources of nearly every country in the world and what those resources comprised she spoke with assurance of the political outlook as well as of the constitution of various leading countries and she seemed to have an intimate knowledge of the markets of the world oh you are wonderful the girl could not help exclaiming after an hour's conversation you seem to know everything do i replied miss statham with a smile which was a little pathetic i had to you know the firm as you can see has very large connections and in a way is more or less linked up with nearly all the great commercial nations and of course i could not occupy a position of trust until i first of all made myself worthy of it but shall we go and have some lunch now i happen to know a place where there is a tolerable degree of comfort and if you don't mind we'll go there but let me get off a few things first she rang a bell as she spoke 
and during the next few minutes interviewed four grey-haired men and gave them certain instructions there she said when she had finished we can be free for two or three hours now when we come back i will introduce you to miss honeywood poor girl she is neither handsome nor interesting and it will be an act of charity on your part to let her live with you this was eleanor's introduction to spurling and kings and her first impressions were confirmed during the weeks that followed at first she wondered a good deal why she had been employed by such a firm in such a capacity with practically no introduction but as time went by this ceased to trouble her she devoted all her powers to the understanding of the work she had to do and did her best to carry out her duties according to her employer's wishes indeed as she told herself again and again she had been marvellously fortunate few girls at her age occupied such an important post as the weeks went by and she understood more and more of the inwardness of the work of the firm her work became increasingly interesting it is true her salary was not very large but it was enough for her to live in comfort and to enjoy a moderate amount of amusement she found miss honeywood just as miss statham had described her it is true her intelligence was somewhat limited while of imagination she had little or none but she was good-natured and refined her parents had been poor but she had the upbringing of a lady and thus eleanor was far more happy in her private life than she had been for some time of wakeham she heard nothing it might appear that he was glad of her silence certainly he took no steps to renew his acquaintance with her little by little too the poignancy of her memories of the last night she saw him became less and less she still thought of it with horror and shame but she tried to drive it away from her mind the moment it came to her why it was she could give no definite explanation but her friendship with tamsin cory and the other women of her set cooled as if by magic she found no delight or interest in tamsin's society indeed when they occasionally met she had something like a feeling of shame that she had once called her friend of rod ravenscroft she had seen nothing since that sunday morning when he had visited her at st hildebrand's mansions neither by word or sign did he remind her of his existence she remembered with bitterness the circumstances which led to his visit as well as the conversation which had taken place between them she tried to cease thinking of him but could not and although she struggled against the feeling which possessed her she knew that it was impossible for her to overcome it as eleanor thought of this she was overwhelmed by a kind of despair it was true she was comfortably situated she had an appointment with a good firm and she was kindly treated but life and the whole outlook of life was utterly barren she felt that she had thrown away happiness even if rod ravenscroft had cared for her he could never be anything to her after what he had seen and heard she had by her own madness destroyed all possibility of his respect in spite of her utmost endeavour to fight against it she found herself recalling the scene when wakeham poured words into her ears which outraged her womanhood she saw herself struggle with him saw herself fighting his would-be caresses leaping out of the taxicab and rushing madly through the streets of london at midnight oh the horror of it she remembered the words those drunken men had said to her they had taken her to be a lost woman of the streets and had spoken to her as such and then while she had fought against them rod ravenscroft had come to her help what must he have thought of her whatever he had felt towards her in the past he could only think of her now with a kind of shame and she she had brought it on herself still eleanor trelawney was a proud girl and she determined to fight her way 
she was interested in her work too her keen intelligence appreciated the far-reaching transactions of spurling and king and she saw that although she had been lately employed she was becoming more and more trusted the more she saw of miss statham the more she respected her she could not help doing so her almost masculine intelligence and her grasp of the broad issues of commerce compelled her admiration socially however she drew no nearer to her miss statham gave her no confidences and asked for none she met her in a friendly way talked to her about their work but beyond this their acquaintance did not go eleanor knew nothing of how or where she lived who her acquaintances were or what her history was that she received a good income there could be no doubt she dressed well and from what eleanor could judge moved in good society she could not help seeing too that she was deeply in the confidence of both her employers while her opinions were greatly respected and generally acted upon by them compared with hers eleanor's was a subordinate position indeed she often had to take orders from miss statham as did others who occupied responsible positions in the firm thus days lengthened into weeks and weeks into months of her home she knew nothing she had intimated to her father and mother that she did not wish any communication with them while she had written to her brother john practically forbidding him to come to see her and all the time she was filled with a great heart hunger it was now ten months since she had left home the time was not long as time goes and yet it seemed to her as though ages had passed since her hampstead days she had made her choice in life but what did it mean what had the future to offer her one day it was just after she had paid her sunday afternoon visit to primrose terrace miss statham came into the room where she was working how do you spend your evenings miss trelawney she asked generally in my rooms replied eleanor occasionally i go to a women's club of which i am a member and now and then i take miss honeywood to a theatre and and that's about all i think i wish you'd come and have some dinner with me on friday night will you i shall be awfully glad if i may replied eleanor aren't you well miss statham oh yes i'm very well i suppose but but never mind about me you will come on friday night then yes but where i was forgetting i live close by regent's park about seven minutes walk from oxford circus subway station you'd rather come there than go to a restaurant wouldn't you besides we can be alone and have a quiet chat here is my address and she handed eleanor a visiting card on the friday evening she found her way to the address miss statham had given her and although she could not explain why she felt that something important was going to happen end of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of prodigal daughters by joseph hawking this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by kate fallis chapter thirty one miss statham eleanor saw at a glance that miss statham's rooms had an appearance of comfort almost amounting to luxury the house which was large and handsome overlooked regent's park and was pleasantly situated years before the whole row in which the house was placed had been occupied by people of position and affluence as years went by however and the craze for flats had grown this with other dwellings of a similar nature had been turned into self-contained suites and let much to the proprietor's profit yes the position is very pleasant assented miss statham when eleanor expressed delight at what she saw it's very convenient too one is in easy access to everything from here and yet away from the noise and crowds 
but come take off your things and sit by the fire we are nearing the end of march but the weather is bitterly cold she led the way into her bedroom as she spoke and eleanor saw taste and comfort everywhere i am glad you like my rooms said miss statham as she noted eleanor's look of approbation you see i have a bathroom adjoining and also another bedroom in case i want to entertain a friend from my point of view i do not suppose i could get anything better i can be in the office in twenty minutes and the people here are very good to me they have a very good cook and the service is on the whole excellent sometimes of course i dine at a restaurant for a change but generally i have my dinner served here alone i see you are looking at my books she went on as they entered the front room again yes i read a good deal i am not often in the humour for going out and i am afraid i am very extravagant in books of course the libraries do one pretty well but i buy a good many all the same somehow i can never enjoy a borrowed book like i can one of my own a little later they sat down to dinner which was deftly served by a quick-footed silent servant everything was cooked to perfection and showed that miss statham could command all that money could give her it was evident too that she was a woman of taste every piece of furniture was a work of art indeed every article in the room suggested a person of culture and affluence and now said miss statham when they had finished dinner drop your chair to the fire and let us talk will you forgive my saying so i took a liking to you the first time we met and i have for a long time wanted to ask you to come here but i kept putting it off as i get older i am afraid to act on impulse i want to think out everything again and again before acting i expect that is because of the responsible position you hold in the firm replied eleanor perhaps so but i am inclined to think i am getting crusted do you know how old i am a little over thirty i should say i am nearly thirty-seven and there was a touch of bitterness in her voice miss trelawney i want to tell you that you are winning golden opinions from both mr spurling and mr king i am saying this despite myself for i honestly believe i am a little bit jealous of you eleanor laughed incredulously it's true replied miss statham women are like that at least women under certain conditions are and they get jealous in spite of themselves do you mind my speaking freely to you i shall be delighted if you will well i think old maids are nearly all in a state of arrested development if a woman does not marry by the time she's thirty-five her nature instead of mellowing kind of shrivels up that's why old maids are sour and vinegary would you mind telling me what are your hopes and prospects that's rather a difficult question my prospects you know them better than i if i please my employers and business continues good perhaps i may advance a little more in their confidence but my hopes the hopes of a girl are oftentimes very silly aren't they are they i'm not sure i don't want to depress you miss trelawney but you asked me the other day whether i was ill no i'm not but i think i am rather miserable i'm sorry replied eleanor politely some people have a genius for friendship went on miss statham i have not i had years ago i think but that part of my nature has become atrophied but i have taken a liking to you i feel that i can speak to you perhaps there's something akin in our natures i want to speak confidentially to you about myself it's an awful confession to make isn't it but i do is it because i'm getting old or is it a woman's whim i am thirty-seven and you are just over twenty i suppose nearly twenty-two replied eleanor 
then there are fifteen years between us do you ever expect to get married no replied eleanor but you will at least i hope you will why should i miss statham was silent for a few seconds miss trelawney she said at length i suppose i am what you might call a well-educated woman my father was a barrister and sufficiently successful to be able to send me to a good school st andrews in fact when i finished there i went on to girton and was supposed to distinguish myself you have some idea of what girton is and how a number of girls will talk when they get together i got mixed up with what was called the advanced set and we discussed in our own way what a woman's life ought to be we greatly believed in woman's rights and we scorned the idea that a woman should in any way live a life inferior to that of a man of course we were angry that we could not take our degrees in the same way men could however much we might be superior to them in intelligence and attainments we claimed that no position should be open to a man which was not also open to a woman in the abstract i suppose we were right anyhow my mind was filled with all that sort of thoughts a number of us laughed at marriage we scorned the idea that any woman should give herself to a man indeed there were many who declared that marriage was a defunct institution and that while it might be necessary in a condition of serfdom it was an outrage in these days of intellectual advancement you understand the sort of thing i am referring to i suppose i was among the most advanced of our little coterie i scorned the idea of falling in love and laughed at marriage she hesitated a little while and then said with a nervous laugh i'm afraid i'm boring you aren't i oh no cried eleanor i'm deeply interested when i was twenty-two went on miss statham a man proposed to me did you like him asked eleanor as miss statham again hesitated i suppose i did yes i'm sure i did he was a nice fellow he took his degree in the year i was a fresher and went to the bar he was not brilliant just a plodding hard-working fellow but he was a gentleman and and i liked him but i refused him i calculated the sort of life i should have to live i knew he would never be a great man he would earn a few hundreds a year perhaps a thousand or two if he were fortunate but nothing more and you refused him yes i refused him i asked myself about the future why should i be tied to a man who would take me to live in some little suburban villa where i should have to be a household drudge and the mother of squalling babies i wanted liberty i wanted to travel i wanted to have a career i wanted to be free from the responsibilities of home life and as i said i refused him i had professed to scorn the idea of love and i had accepted what we called our advanced thinking very eagerly yes and then asked eleanor with wide open eyes my mother died when i was about twelve went on miss statham and just after harry Perdue proposed to me my father died he was not in the front rank of successful men but he left me just over two hundred a year enough to support me i felt awfully lonely but i would not lower the flag of the set with which i had become associated for we had formed a kind of cult i had dreamed of taking up some public work of distinguishing myself by being in the vanguard of some advanced movement so i settled down to work i wrote a novel a kind of problem novel the thing that was fashionable fifteen years ago it was not a great success although it brought me a number of complimentary reviews then for a time i edited a weekly paper the new woman kind of thing it died in a few months 
presently mr king who had been a friend of my father's offered me a post in his firm and being at a loose end at the moment i took it i suppose i had some aptitude for business for i was able to please both members of the firm and got more and more trusted it's not much of a story is it and she laughed a little bitterly it is very interesting affirmed eleanor of course i had other offers of marriage went on miss statham but i did not regard them seriously what love i had had been given to harry Prideaux, and i had refused him a silence fell between the two women a silence which was almost painful presently however miss statham burst out almost angrily why have i told you this i am a middle-aged woman now in three years i shall be forty with my youth and whatever beauty i had all gone while you are a young girl just over twenty why should i bore you but you are not boring me cried eleanor miss statham started to her feet walked to a window pulled aside the curtain and looked out into the night then she came back miss trelawney she said i am telling you this because i have been a fool oh such a fool eleanor was silent she did not know what to say yes i suppose i have been a successful woman went on miss statham i have a position of trust and responsibility i earn a big income in a way i am interested deeply interested in the enterprises of the firm there's nothing sordid about them they touch the big things of life they bring me into contact with people who occupy high places i have a great deal of liberty too sometimes i travel more than once the partners have commissioned me to go abroad and deal with big things for two months in the year i can do pretty much as i like and during the past few years i have gone to the most interesting places in the world i am a member of the best woman's club in london and having the advantage of a good name and being what is called well connected i am invited to all sorts of good houses as you see i have surrounded myself with pretty things i can afford to do so mr spurling and mr king who in spite of their old-fashioned ideas are both broad-minded men pay me just as they would pay a man in my position and if i wanted more money i could have it i live as you see in comfort i have no need to trouble about money at all and yet miss trelawney i am not happy and i have been a fool why how asked the girl because i would give it all up gladly give it up to be in that suburban villa i used to scorn the drudge of a man the mother of squalling youngsters i would give anything now to see little children coming into a room putting their arms round my neck and calling me mother i would give years of my life to be the housefrau that i used to despise but think of your position your freedom persisted eleanor position freedom cried miss statham what is it worth what are my prospects what have i to look forward to i'm thirty-seven in a few more years i shall want to retire well i shall be able to do so in comfort but what then what are the prospects of a loveless old maid what lies at the end of it all what is the value of all this silly jargon about careers for women mind in a way it's all right i fully believe that careers should be open to women and there are some women who are obliged to live single lives but speaking for myself i have played a fool i have realized through the years that i did love harry Prideaux. oh yes he's still alive he's married for that matter and i suppose has difficulty in making both ends meet but he is happy his children are growing up around him he has all the amenities of home life and his wife i met her some time ago her dress was a little shabby 
but i knew by the light in her eyes that she possessed the secret of which i knew nothing why did you leave home miss trelawney the question came out like a pistol shot because oh i wanted to be free replied eleanor because i had contracted all sorts of ideas during the war and i hated the restrictions of home life you know how things have been these last few years i met your father some time ago said miss statham one of the most delightful men i think i ever saw eleanor was silent i imagine that he was somewhat of a stickler for old-time views though and miss statham watched her companion closely as she spoke yes replied eleanor you see he had been away from home for several years and while he was away new ideas came to the front conventions are broken down the custom of a girl having a chaperone when she goes to a dance is laughed at girls demand latch-keys and resent being questioned as to where they have been and what they have been doing and i suppose when your father came home he insisted on on home discipline i suppose in his way he was very kind said eleanor slowly but he would have obedience he forbade certain of my friends to come to the house he would not consent to my going to a dance except in accordance with his ideas he protested against girls going out to supper with men after theatres he but oh you know the sort of thing so you left home yes i left home and what is it all worth what do you mean i mean your so-called liberty miss trelawney isn't home life the comforts and the refinements and the love of home life a thousand times more than than what you have got have you heard anything about me asked eleanor not much but mr spurling told me you had left home and that you had asked him not to write to your father it was easy to guess the rest i can see the kind of girl you are but miss trelawney when you have said all that can be said about the higher education of women and careers for women and all that sort of thing the true career for a woman is to be married to a good man to have the cares of a home and to become the mother of children there is nothing higher nothing holier in all the wide world oh if only i had a home and brothers and sisters and and children i tell you it's not only insanity but rank blasphemy to talk as some do about marriage i have heard women talk about their right to have children without marriage ties all that sort of thing was born in hell i've thought about it all heard all the arguments about it and i tell you marriage is a sacred thing and if ever it is destroyed the best things in life will be destroyed oh god what fools we women are especially those of us who are called intellectual have you any religion miss trelawney eleanor made no reply it's all part of the same thing we women think we know better than god think we can do without god and all the rest follows after all the happiest people in the world and the most useful people in the world are those who find new avenues of usefulness along old paths for hours they talked the woman of thirty-seven and the girl of twenty-two no further reference was made to eleanor's leaving home yet every word the other spoke made eleanor realize the inwardness of what she had done and presently when she made her way back to st hildebrand's mansions she was in a very thoughtful mood the next day peggy came to see her and after taking her to the theatre the two girls had returned to eleanor's rooms and had talked long and earnestly together she did not tell peggy a word about her visit to miss statham in fact she had been extremely reticent about her own thoughts and feelings nevertheless after she had gone 
and she found herself alone she sat for a long time thinking hard and wonderingly when miss honeywood came back she wondered at eleanor's silence wondered too at the strange look in her eyes what are you doing to-day miss trelawney asked miss honeywood on the sunday morning nothing in particular replied eleanor why my cousins have asked me to go and stay with them at their house in enfield and i thought you might like to come with me they have often asked me to bring you to see them it's awfully good of them eleanor made answer but not to-day thank you i don't feel in the humour for seeing people i think i want to be alone when miss honeywood left however the girl found herself in a very unsettled frame of mind miss statham's words haunted her of what use after all was the freedom she had gained it was not as though she had no home and was obliged to live as she was doing had that been the case she thought she could have been tolerably content but in spite of everything the thought of home made a strong appeal to her she could not help remembering what miss statham had said about her father yes in a way she was proud of him he might be a little puritanical but he was a gentleman still a gentleman of the highest order he was lovable too in her antagonism to his restrictions she had declared she had not a particle of affection for him but as she sat thinking about him that morning something seemed to rise up in her heart something which she could not understand not that she intended to go back her pride if nothing else forbade that she could not conceive herself confessing that she had made a mistake and yet and yet where was rod ravenscroft she wondered since that morning after the awful night which she still shuddered to think about she had never seen him never heard of him of course he had forgotten her probably he had become engaged to that girl she had seen him with on hampstead heath or if not her another oh, what a fool what a blind fool she had been her heart ached the thought of living her life without him and yet she would have to suppose she should succeed even as miss statham had succeeded and suppose she were to receive a salary sufficient to enable her to live amid such surroundings as miss statham lived what then then the other side rose up before her after all marriage was a sordid miserable thing and men in the main were brutes peggy had married the man she said she loved yet think of her spending her life with such a creature as barnes think of the intimate associations which a wife must have with such a husband the thought was nauseous and all men were essentially the same mean selfish mere animals who looked upon women as their playthings no on the whole she was glad of what she had done she eleanor trelawney could never become the orthodox wife she could never submit to a lifetime association with any man even although her heart were at that moment aching for rod ravenscroft she took a book from a shelf and tried to read but the thing would not hold her attention she found her mind wandering what was peggy doing she wondered the child's misery had saddened her and she instinctively felt how peggy loathed the thought of going back to primrose terrace she herself became heavy-hearted and miserable at the thought of it she threw aside the book she could not stay indoors but where could she go the day was a wild and stormy one and the dark clouds which had swept across the sky were in accord with her feelings yet she felt anxious about peggy somehow or another she was possessed with the idea that all was not right that something more than ordinary had happened she remembered half with a laugh of amusement and half with a feeling of disgust her experiences at primrose terrace and she could not think of going there again 
all the same when afternoon came she made her way towards the tube that would take her to camden town yes she felt she must go she wanted to assure herself that no harm had happened to her sister a little later she stood at the door of thirteen primrose terrace and knocked there was no reply she knocked again and again still there was no answer the house was empty what could it mean she was about to turn away when the door of the adjoining house was opened you want to see mrs barnes asked a slatternly woman i want to see young mrs barnes yes well she ain't here mrs barnes and the girls are gone away for a bit of an holiday where jim barnes is i don't know are you the sister of the young lady what married jim barnes yes well then you can't see her and the woman laughed meaningly i don't understand said eleanor is there anything wrong it's not for me to say nothing although i am a next-door neighbour but perhaps i ought to tell you young mrs barnes went out yesterday about half past one and no sooner had she gone than mrs barnes and the girls left the house mrs barnes says to me mrs simpkins she says me and the girls are going off for a bit of an holiday and we shan't be back for a few days while jim is off on his own if that young minx of a wife of his comes here knocking as i expect she will you can give her this letter it will give her full explanation she says but but what do you mean asked eleanor i'm telling you as fast as i can i went out to the movies last night went out about eight and didn't come back until after ten i hadn't been back long when i heard the knocker of number thirteen going like anything so i just opened the door and there was your sister it would seem that she didn't know anything about mrs barnes and the girls going away for when i told her she seemed all stunned like i gave her the note which mrs barnes had left and that's all at least that's all i know for certain although i've me thoughts i ain't lived here for nothing mrs barnes have told me a lot she have more than once she says to me jim's wife may be a lady she says and have a lot of aristocratic connections she says but she don't bring a penny with her and jim ain't going to stand her tantrums when she came here first mrs barnes kind of crowed it all for me and made out that she was superior to me and was going to be invited to the general's house and all that sort of thing but i told her what i thought then i did and when i sees how things were going on and heard what the girls said i was able to put two and two together i was but you gave my sister a note yes i give it to her just as it was guff to me i'm a respectable woman i am and didn't open it nor nothing and she what did she say she didn't say nothing she seemed all stunned like and as she had never been friendly with me i just closed the door as soon as i gave her the letter is that all you know asked eleanor well it is and it isn't just out of curiosity like i opened the door again and watched her and i see her go down the steps and walk away by herself she didn't seem to know where she was going or what she was doing then i see her stand under that lamp-post and read the letter i gave her i watched her for two or three minutes while she stood there and then she kind of staggered away and is that all you know that's all i know wasn't my business and she never even condescended to speak to me so why should i trouble but i have me thoughts all the same eleanor left primrose terrace almost frenzied with anxiety she had heard enough to tell her the whole miserable story what had happened was evident but what had become of peggy where had she gone she had a few shillings in her pocket she knew she had given her some money herself but where had she gone what had she done 
if the barnes's door was closed against her where could she go where had she passed the night the thought of peggy wandering through the miserable streets of camden town late at night homeless and friendless was horrible to contemplate and yet that was what must have happened to her almost unconsciously she made her way back to st hildebrand's mansions she wanted to be alone she wanted to think out the whole situation the thought was maddening peggy her sister to be placed in such an awful predicament she a young girl to be homeless friendless deserted she thought she saw the reason why peggy had not come to her she was too proud too ashamed to confess the ghastly truth she dismissed the thought that peggy had gone home to hampstead with scarcely a moment's consideration she remembered that her sister had said only the previous night that she could never go home again but where was she that was the thought which haunted her with ghastly persistency she made herself a cup of tea and then having hurriedly swallowed it went out again the room seemed to stifle her presently she found herself in holborn sunday evening though it was buses rushed thither and thither while pedestrians thronged the sidewalks unheeding whither she went she turned her face eastward and presently found herself in the city she had no reason for going there she simply followed a blind impulse the traffic was much thinner here and she was able to think more calmly as she walked the church bells began to ring they were calling the people to worship she had told herself again and again that that kind of thing had no meaning to her that it had gone with a hundred other effete institutions and yet these church bells had a meaning all over the land they would be ringing calling the people to prayer there was something beautiful in the thought in spite of everything why should one pray and why was it that what people called religion still appealed to people when intellectually they had given up the creeds of their fathers of course too religion was associated with some ethical code and after all the best and the most thoughtful people in the world had declared their need of it she eleanor trelawney was a living being with all sorts of hopes and longings and desires what was life after all what did it mean was there anything after death of what she saw and heard during her walk back to st hildebrand's mansions she knew nothing cared nothing when she saw the great block of buildings of which her little rooms formed a tiny part she almost shuddered it might be hours before miss honeywood would return how could she bear to pass the time alone she entered the vestibule with a heartache such as she thought she had never felt before and then suddenly she started back like one afraid the place was dimly lit and the man who attended the lift did not appear to be near but she had a kind of consciousness that she was being watched eleanor it is you isn't it it was peggy's voice peggy the word was a gasp is is it you yes can't you see then the floodgates of eleanor's heart were opened and throwing her arms round her sister's neck she sobbed convulsively oh thank god thank god she cried but why she said it she did not know end of chapter thirty one